Welcome to this podcast where director Jeff T. Thomas chats with some of the most talented TV and film directors in the industry. This is an in-depth look at how they got into the business, as well as sharing some of the most defining moments in their career. This is The Director's Podcast. From stepping onto his first film set as a 19-year-old rapper to creating his own show on Netflix... My next guest wrote, directed, produced, edited, and even location managed his first feature film. He also starred in it, as he did his Emmy Award-nominated show, It's Bruno. I asked Slick Naeem, what was the first time he realized that he wanted to work in the film industry? Well, for me, the first time I figured out I wanted to work in the film industry was um, through music. So, you know, I started off as a rapper. Um, This was like... Webster Hall, like for all my New Yorkers, this was like small venues, like Bowery Club, you know, SOBs. We're talking about like a max capacity of like 100, you know, 200 people max. So, so yeah, the type of rap, you know, it was more like, you know, kind of street, uh, melodic. You know, I was influenced by like guys like Pac, Biggie, too, um, you know, Nas, um, you know, Bone Thugs, Nick Dogg. So, uh, you know, it always had a bit of soul to it, and then I, would, I was like a big uh, old school head, so I would listen to a lot of like Bobby Womack and the Dramatics and like um, music that I actually got put on to through movies, right? Through watching like um, old school films, I would I would like you know be attracted to certain um, you know artists that I would have never heard of otherwise. It's not like I would have heard them on the radio or anything like that. So I've, that was also a very special kind of opportunity that I like that I grasp on is the fact that you can introduce new music to a younger generation through film, um, something, and only through film or TV, right? It's like you can't, they'll, they're never gonna hear uh, uh, some, some like esoteric record from the 1960s in any other, you know, medium except film or TV. So like when I'm making my films in, in, uh, or, or episodes, I'm, I'm grabbing like little gems. Like I'm trying to find these little songs that like ho- hopefully no one's really heard of. And I'm kind of like a DJ breaking a record, you know what I mean? But on, um, you know, a film or, or TV episode. But, but yeah, so that was the type of music I was doing. Those were kind of my influences. Then after seeing Slick at one of these gigs, a couple of film students approached and asked if they could make a music video for him. They, yeah, they actually approached me in school. Um, so, so they were in the film program and I was in a music program. I was in the, the, a school called the Clyde Davis School of Recorded Music. Um, and uh, so we were, I think we had, um, uh, what do you call it, electives or whatever. I took a, a music and score class, so it was like, you know, yeah, it was like how to score, um, you know, your favorite scenes in, in films and stuff like that. And um, in that that class was in the film department building, and that's where in the hallway they approached me. Slick then presented the film students with some ideas for the video of his own, and they loved them. Not long after, he stepped onto his first film set. It was a tiny crew because remember they, they were doing this for free, so it was just uh, you know, five, six people. Um, you know, one guy was holding a reflector board, you know, another guy was, you know, holding a camera and, you know, was doing sound. And maybe they, maybe they had a PA, and then I had a couple of my friends that were helping out. Uh, very, very, like, bare bones. Felt very natural, cool, you know, at ease with me, you know. I wasn't nervous or nothing like that. Um, and it was pretty simple a shoot. It wasn't like a complicated shoot. It was basically just me. My, and my friends in the neighborhood, you know, fucking around and, and then maybe some stuff in school and on the street and on the basketball court and on the sidewalk and that, that was pretty much it, you know what I mean? Um, but, but it was shot very interestingly and kind of in a way that uh, made it kind of different and stand out a bit, you know, some stuff was silhouetted and stuff like that. I remember the director surprised me with some stuff he was doing, some effects he was doing. and. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty straightforward, simple shoot. So I, I, I watched them, you know, I saw how they were directing and how they were doing it. And um, it seemed kind of natural to me, you know, like with everything they were doing seemed very secondhand to me. You know what I mean? Like uh, there was nothing that kind of 
was like, oh shit, I can never do that. You know, it was like, oh, like, you know, that's all they're doing. You know what I mean? Like, that's all it says. I was like, I can do that. But like I said, it was a very simple shoot, so, you know, it wasn't the best thing to judge. But, um, yeah, so from there, then I just um, I eventually got a camera and I just started doing a bunch of trial and error, you know, on the camera, testing out different things, going to shoot stuff, you know, testing out lenses and stuff like that and figuring out, you know, interesting ways to shoot. And a good friend of mine, he's like an older brother to me, uh, he was already kind of shooting like little commercials and stuff like that. So he had a lot of gear and um, and I would borrow his uh, Canon, uh, I think it was like a 5D back, back then, something like that. And, um, and yeah, so I was testing I was doing test shoots and, and messing around with his camera and then learning how to edit uh, in Final Cut Pro, uh, Final Cut Pro 7. I remember I was learning how to mess around on there and like slow things, do slow motion and ramp things up and you know, add effects and all that stuff. So I kind of like, just kind of learned, cause that was major, you know, learning how to edit. Huge advantage, uh, uh, you know, to, to apply to directing too. But, but yeah, so it's just kind of like, Again, it was like nothing but trial and error, trying to figure it out step by step, you know, just kind of self-teaching, you know, YouTube tutorials, stuff like that, figuring it out. I mean, that's the amazing thing about what this has evolved into now. If you need to learn how to do anything, it's all there on YouTube, right? It's like, you know, you need to learn how to do a sound package to, to do something like this. Go onto YouTube, you can find it, and you can exactly. teach yourself in a fraction of the time of what it used to be. I was already a, a, an advocate not for school, you know. Uh, I was anti, I was anti school because um, I was. I always knew that, you know, uh, whatever I was gonna do, um, I knew it was gonna be somewhat in the arts, and uh, I knew that a degree wasn't gonna help me at all uh, in my career. But so, but coming from, you know, an immigrant family, you know what I mean. Um, that was, you know. It was everything for my mother, you know, to get a degree. And, you know, they, they do they do so much, they sacrifice so much to to come to the country, into this country, and they kind of expect you to, you know, uh, pay your debt and get a degree. So that was basically why why I did that was to just give that to my mom and be like, here you go. Now I'm gonna, you know, be a, this this rapper director, uh, and no one will ever ask me <laughs> for my degree, you know. With this newfound knowledge and passion, it was time for Slick to start directing some music videos of his own. Yeah, I was shooting. Uh, so during during that, I, I was I was shooting a bunch of little little music videos here and there. Um, I was shooting. Um, I shot this. I shot this kind of like a hip hop comedic video called the Second Floor Elevator Pushing Motherfucker," which is about a you know a you know perfectly fit person comes coming into the elevator and pressing two when everybody's late, you know, and they have to all, you know, they're all like trying to go on the floor that's like above three. And um, and that what that actually took off, you know, that, that became a, a little viral and and then um and that and then I started, you know, doing a little little videos like this here and there, you know, just directing little videos, little music videos. So humor was something that you were interested in from the beginning then? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And is that because you had certain film references, or there were directors or writers that you liked up until that point, or was it just a general thing? No, I think it's a general thing. Like I was, I was also kind of a class clown a bit. You know, I was always clowning around. You know what I mean? So it, it, I always had this kind of sense of humor. Um, that always kind of bled into my music and visuals as well. So you you've directed a bunch of your music videos. How did you then go to directing other music videos for other people? Were these friends or people you knew from the rapping scene? Yeah, um, yeah, it was like up and comers. No, nobody big. We had this one opportunity uh, to direct a video for Talib Kweli, who was major, uh, big, big artist uh, from New York. Um, and that was dope. I remember it's it's a very slept on video actually. Not, not too many people have seen it or know about it. Um, but it's called Hamster Wheel, and um, that was the first kind of music video um, I directed with my with my boy who owned the camera equipment, Sam. And uh, I remember I was excited because I was taking these uh, movie themes and applying it to a music video. So like um, Unbreakable, um, that 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 scene where. Um, Bruce Willis realizes that, you know, he can touch 
anybody he touches, you can see their sins and, and, and then, you know, figure out, you know, how to take them down or whatever. Uh, mixed with, um, uh, I forget the name of it, but this movie with uh, Denzel Washington and John Goodman, where it's this evil spirit that's being trans transferred uh, from person to person through touch. So I, so I thought it would be dope if I, that was done through rap. So if like Talib Kweli wasn't even rapping, you know, it was like, it started with this one person who's rapping and then that person's walking down the street and accidentally touches another person. And then that person picks up where the other person left off and we see the story of the rap. He's, he's telling you a story and the story is intercut with um, these people's sins that correlate with what he's talking about. So it was very kind of, it was very like advanced complex thing. Uh, and it came off pretty, and it came off great, and it came out great. But um, but again, uh, it was still small scale. I always was working with low budgets and stuff like that. So how, you know, how long did that go on for? And how did you move into the narrative from there? Well, it was pretty simple, right? I was making these little music videos and um, everything was just sort of plateauing. <clears throat> it wasn't really, taken off like I like I thought it would or like I hoped it would and um on top of that like I felt like there was a lot of other rappers coming out that I felt like I was much better than and they were getting a whole lot more you know attention and views and clicks and all that stuff with very simple videos and stuff like that so at that point um I said uh, to myself um all right well I don't want to compete with these guys you know in just this lane let me, you know, try to stand out and show my skills in film, you know, and, and, and in directing with the music, with the rap. So that was the conception of Full Circle, which essentially was created, a script was, that was created from music. So I had four songs that I wrote that each told a story. And then um, I figured out a way to narratively connect those four songs into an overarching story and from that I wrote the script I wrote a, the, this feature film script all based off these four songs and um, and that was going to be my thing I, originally it was going to be like a short film I had in mind I was like oh this would be like four music videos you know put together you know with little scenes in between that was like originally my idea and then um I wrote this 40 page script to it and I remember shopping that around everybody was saying crazy that's not a short film they were like 40 because I mind you I have no knowledge or education in, in this in this field and um, I thought it was just as easy as like all right you know I just need five thousand dollars and um, I got this 40 page script and I got the music let's go you know and that's what I was like trying to do and everybody was, you know eventually I realized that you know that that was silly but um but it was still that that idea that motivated me, you know, to eventually getting it done. So everybody was saying that the 40 page script is not a short film and that, you know, that it's great and that we should make it a feature. Uh, so write more. And I still remember thinking to myself, like, write more, like 40 pages, that's the most I've ever read in my life at that point, you know, at like 19 or whatever. I was like, that's crazy. Like, I'm not trying to write more, but that response was overwhelming. Um, you know, and I was kind of inundated with, you know, people telling me to just make it a feature. So, uh, so I was like, all right, let me try. And eventually I just kind of sat my ass down and wrote another, I don't know, 40 pages or something like that. So it was like 80 something pages. And then I had a, I had a full feature and then, then it was figuring out how to get that made. Right. Then I had to figure out how to get that made. Um, so with no money, right. And no connections. Um, so that was, the, that was the hardest thing was figuring that out uh, and just going to all these film schools and posting up, posting up flyers and, you know, getting, getting everybody to work for free and putting up casting calls and uh, then going to Kickstarter and raising money online and, you know, shaking a cup for every, anybody and everybody you know, family and friends and all that stuff. Uh, and eventually, and then mom and pop shops, I was like going to like every local shop in my neighborhood in Bushwick, which is where I was going to shoot the film, you know, trying to get them uh, incentivized to invest in the movie, whether it be a couple hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, and we're going to use your shop as a location and it's going to be promoted and all that stuff. And, you know, if you give me two thousand, I'll even put the name in the script and all that shit, you know what I mean? I had, to, I had a whole pitch. I had a whole pitch. I was good, you know, I even put on a like a button-up shirt and dress pants <laughs> and 
and I was with an iPad, my mother's iPad that I bought from her, and I was like going around shop to shop, like showing, you know, this like um, I put together this like it was essentially my Kickstarter video, you know, my pitch reel about how I'm gonna make the movie, and I would show it to all these shop owners. And anyway, eventually I raised like twenty thousand dollars. I raised about twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, I was able to get a sponsor to one of these stores to sponsor me, um, and. Uh, and yeah, and, and then I uh, then I thought I had all the money I needed, uh, and everybody then everybody was like, you know, people were telling me, all right, now you got enough for your lawyer fees. Now we got to raise a quarter million dollars, you know. <laughs> and to me, you know, that was like, you know, that was a joke. You know what I mean? I was like, I've never seen that kind of money, never been around it, and I didn't see how the fuck I was gonna raise that. So um, so I said, no, I'm gonna shoot this movie for for what I have, and um, and we did. I managed to do it just to shoot it for for that for twenty twenty thousand. It's actually a little less than that, but um, and that was that was my film school. You know, that's how I kind of had to figure it all out. Like that everything. is amazing. I thought you had told me previously that you made it for twenty thousand. I'm watching it and this, I'm like, there's no way you made this movie for twenty thousand. I'm like, maybe two hundred thousand, maybe. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, no, I mean that to me. I think even. I don't know how, how I'll top that. Honestly, I don't. I don't. I think that's probably one of my biggest accomplishments. Um, just, just being so resourceful and being forced to learn so much. You know, like I had to learn how to produce. You know, I had to learn how to get the SAG contracts, the insurance, the um, the, the the catering. You know. Um, there was then I had to also there was it was it was ridiculous. Then I had to learn how to get some something that was called a carnet because my sound guy and co-director, um that was that's important, I had a co-director on that film, who came from Finland and, and invested in the film too. So I had to fly them out, or we had to figure out a way to fly them out, and, and, and the sound guy was bringing all his sound equipment. Um and he was working for free. So so that was another reason how big savings, right? But but um, he was bringing all his equipment, and I had to house him in my in my living room. And this is a railroad apartment, so a railroad apart a New York railroad apartment is one skinny like hallway, and um, the kitchen's here, and then the room is here, and then the little office is here, and then the bedroom is here. So, and then the bathroom is by the kitchen. So if you want to, you always have to go through the whole apartment, you know, to get to the bathroom where the bedroom is. And he was sleeping in the living room. So it was a mess. It was a mess. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, so just I had to figure, you know, customs and stuff like that. He was bringing like $50,000 worth of equipment. So that was like, it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing. I learned it all. I learned how to, you know, how to do it all on an indie level like that. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, it was the most, it was definitely the most excruciating um, time of my life because um, cause of, the, cause of the amount that was on my shoulders, you know, to carry this production through. You know, it was it was just ridiculous. I'll never forget it. It was like 21 days of, of sleeping for like three hours, you know, getting like three hours of sleep. I remember I was only like 21 or 22 at that time. And I was get, starting to get like locked jaw and like back problems and stuff like that, you know, just from like the amount of stress and, and lack of, of sleep and stuff like that. But all, all in all, you know, pulled it off, you know, pulled it off. First of all, that's phenomenal i can't even i mean i directed my first video when i was 21 and it was a hell of a lot of work even though i had a lot of help you know coming from music videos going into a movie like that how did you what was your approach i mean you have actors you had you were playing the lead as well so you were also acting in it can you just talk us a little yeah. bit uh, about that yeah yeah that wasn't uh, originally the plan um I didn't want to be the lead in it. I wanted to get a, you know, a named actor, right, to play the lead, and I was just gonna have the music, you know. Uh, I was gonna do the music and and co-direct it, um, and, and, and I wrote it already. So, you know, um, that just, you know, for twenty thousand dollars, we just wasn't gonna get anybody. You know, that was this, that was the hard truth, and uh, and so at that point, I was like, well. You know, I know all the lines, you know, I wrote them and, um, you know, I'm comfortable in front of the camera and, you know, I, let's do this, you know, and, and co-director was cool with that. I think what's important um, to mention is that the team that I was able to assemble, um, like, especially my DP, 
uh, Chris Canucciari, um, you know, Mike Gafford. Like, these guys were in the business, right? They they knew what they were doing. <laughs> so, luckily, I, I, I did have some people on the team that, you know, knew what they were doing, knew the lingo and the language and the camera, um, you know, movements and, 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 and the names and all that stuff. Uh, so I was able to lean on them a lot as far as like, all right, look, this is what I want. And like, we still do this even to this day. Like, you know, like you, when you're working on a, on a new show or a new film, you know, you, it's all about collaboration. You tell the DP what you want and then he pitches you the idea of how to make it happen and you guys, you know, it's harmonious, right? So so that's how, that's kind of how it was for, for, with me on that film. Um, you know, I had a few professional crew members on there that were able to execute my vision um, and that was uh, that definitely made it, uh, you know, a lot easier um, for me. Not that anything was easy on that set, but it was definitely a bit of a relief, uh, you know, on there. And mind you, also our DP, our original DP Gaffer and Key Grip dropped out three days before our first shoot day, too. On top of that, so these guys came in in the last, you know, the last minute, and uh, that ended up being the best. You know, scenario because I, I still they're still all friends of mine. You know, the the DP and everything. Now that the movie was shot, it was time to start the editing process. And of course, even after writing, producing, directing, and starring in the movie, Slick then took it upon himself to do the editing too. So we had a, an assistant editor um, cut everything first, right? Organize it all, cut it all together, and then um, and then sent me uh, an assembly. Um, and then from there, from there I went in and, um, and that was fun. Editing was actually fun because, um, it reminded me of like, like, I remember there was a phase, you know, in high school where I was playing video games, you know, and like, you would just be hooked. You'd be playing for like four or five hours, you know, Gears of War. I remember you'd be online with your boys talking shit and, you know, shooting it up. And like when you're done, your eyes would be bloodshot, you know, because you'd just be like watching the screen for like nonstop. And that's exactly what it was when, we, when I was editing that, that film. Or anytime I get into a heavy edit, it's like you're just in the zone, you know what I mean? Like nothing's, nothing else is like matters or it can distract you and you're like having this fun process, a fun creative process where you're able to like take one scene and make it, make it, um, work in four different ways right and like you, or you can tell the same this one story in so many different ways just from the edit so i had i remember i had uh spent a lot of time like just hours and hours and hours like on that computer just editing but enjoying it you know and when you finished with the movie what did you do with it then how did you get it out there so yeah once i finished then then right then you're in a new phase you're in a whole new world of hustle uh, so at that point, it was all about the festivals. It was the film festival hustle. And that was trying to avoid as many submission fees as possible. You know, so that's like, so that was the work, right? It's like calling them all up, emailing them all, you know, explaining my situation, you know, trying to cajole them into, you know, allowing me to waive that that fee, you know, giving, hoping to get that, uh, that like discount code, you know, like, oh, apply this code and uh, this was when, this is when it was without a box. Now I think it's called, um, it's called something else, Film Freeway or something like that. But it was a website where you could uh, go and, and, and submit to multiple festivals at a time and stuff like that. And, um, and yeah, some, you know, but all those submission fees are like $50, you know, $30, $80, you know, and if you multiply that by like 20, you know, 30, it really starts to add up. So that was my whole thing, was trying to submit to as many festivals as I could without paying the submission fee and stuff like that. Um, and then following up, you know, it was the same thing about, it was basically applying the same hustle I had to securing locations on my set, securing crew, right? Always calling and, you know, negotiating, and figuring out a price and all that. Yeah, I was definitely, I was the location manager as well on, uh, on, uh, on Full Circle. It was just nonstop, you know, it was nonstop. And then, so yeah, eventually we got into a few festivals and um, the festivals that we did get, get into, I believe we, we won uh, like almost all of them. Uh, won something, yeah, in, in, in almost all of them. And the one that um, Urban World Film Festival was the, and, and ABFF, those were the ones that um, uh, had distributors in the audience 
and that's when we got our deal. Um, E1 picked it up, bought it, and then they licensed it to Netflix and BET. That's incredible. So how did you go from doing that to breaking into television? So, yeah, so like you said, right, that was gladiator school for me, and that was kind of what shaped me as um, as um, a director and just a hustler, you know, so like someone who wasn't going to take no for an answer and was going to get into the business somehow, some way. So now, so get this, my movie's on Netflix, right? I shot it for $20,000, it's won a bunch of awards, film festival awards, and I still have zero representation. Not a f- agent, not a manager, and I'm trying to get. I'm like cold calling these places, these agencies, and these management companies as a different person. You know what I mean? Telling them about my project. You know what I mean? Because I was like, nobody wants to hear the, the you know the same guy pitch himself. So I'm like calling as like my man. I was calling as like my fictitious manager, you know, named Oscar or something like that. You know, and trying to get the film to 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 to, to these people and to these agents, and then, anyway, I got nowhere. You know, it was it was very frustrating. Um, you know, I was doing catering services. You know, I was a caterer and a personal trainer, and I was doing still these bullshit jobs uh, just to pay rent and stuff like that. You know, meanwhile with this with a movie that you know that's that's out and. And, um, you know, oh, 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 and this is another crazy thing that happened with that movie. <laughs> so, um, I made a bunch of connections in the New York Mayor's Office of Film, uh, Motion Picture and Television. And, uh, because they, you know, because they, they took a keen in- interest in me because of everything, right? They knew my budget was the lowest that they seen at the time. And, and I was the youngest um, producer that they had at the time. So everybody kind of knew who I was. And uh, they have this like uh, marketing credit um, that 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 is like kind of like a lottery kind of thing. That's only some films uh, that are only made in New York. Seventy percent of the film has to be made in New York to be eligible. Um, and if you uh, if you're chosen, they basically give you almost like a million dollar marketing campaign, where where your where your film your poster is going to be on on buses trains taxis 30 seconds of the trailer is going to play in the taxi cab new york taxi cab uh what else subway st- um bus stop stations as well as the buses and we and i got it full circle got that so now my film was like i'll never forget i have you know i have videos and pictures but i remember getting on the train to go home and uh, on the j train and my fucking movie is in the is in the subway is on, is on the train yeah, full circle. Yeah, and then and then the bus stop. My mother worked at the UN, and there was a bus stop by her office that had my that had full circle on it. And so that so 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 and then yeah, so people started to hit me up, you know, mm-hmm. like in the city, you know, kids I went to like middle school with, and they're like, "Oh, slick, you made it!" <laughs> they're like, "You made it! Wow!" Like, "Yo, your movie's out, and we see the poster everywhere." And meanwhile, I'm working like at catering and like personal training, you know what I mean? Trying to like you know pay rent and stuff like that. So that was funny, but that was dope. And then also, I think that was at that point, um, my whole cast and crew of the film who were. Um, rightfully doubtful right of what was going to happen with this film right because they saw a twenty thousand dollar what a, what it's what a twenty thousand dollar production looks like on set <laughs> is what you think it looks yeah. like right the film doesn't look like that but but on set it's, it looks just like that it looks like like shit you know what i mean but uh but you know we turn we turn shit into gold and uh and so when they all saw the the final version then i i, I pretty much had my team you know they were ready to rock with me Amazing. for whatever Amazing. you know they were like yo whatever you want to do next we're here you know because we see what you did with this so 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 anyway so so yeah so i got nowhere actually uh, just with that film so um except obviously i made a network right now i have a little network at least so now i, I have a film crew and i also have uh, festival programmers who know me and uh, so now I, I built a network in that f- fashion right and, uh, and and distributors who know me so i had to make another film um, I knew I had to make another film because everybody was asking me what's next, what do you have next? And I knew this time I was never going to do another low budget feature again 
because of the scrutiny, it's just the pain and the fucking agony that I went through. I said I was gonna do a short next, mm -hmm. and that was uh, became Stanhope, mm -hmm. and um, and we did the same exact process with that one, same thing, same crew, that's full circle, same Kickstarter, you know, program. I raised uh, sixteen thousand dollars at that point, um, and uh, same thing, shot the film for just for a little under that, and um, and since it was short, even though it wasn't really short, it came out to twenty seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I had to knock it down to, to 18. Um, and that one took off. That one took off. That one, that one took off way more because I think, in my opinion, I think it was because it was a short film, uh, it was able to be more viral in, in, within the Hollywood circuit. Because if you're an agent, manager, whatever, you, you're busy. You know, you got a lot of shit to watch. You got a lot of calls to answer, a lot of emails to reply to. And you don't have much time. But if, you're give them, if you give them a film they can watch in the office and just pass it around, you, you know, and it's that powerful in, in a short period of time, you're gonna win. Yeah. And that's what happened. That's what happened with Stanhope. So Stanhope changed the game for me. Um, again, hit all the festivals up, did, did even better. We won the HBO uh, award, short film, film festival award, HBO licensed it um, directly because of that. And then all, all those HBO executives um, who were on that festival program, um, um, told me to put it together as a television pitch and pitch it to them as a TV series, and so that was um, so that was a moment. Uh, it's so much, man. It's a lot. I'm, I'm, now I'm recalling so much of, of, of the journey, but um, I think that's when I started my first trip to LA. That's when I started coming out to LA after I won the HBO Film Festival award. That's when representation started to come my way. That's when all the big agencies started to knock started emailing and knocking on my door and asking me, you know, and wanting to rep me. So then it became, it went from me calling all these agencies to them all calling me now, um, which was great, which was a great feeling. So uh, so I went to LA and um, and I remember, I, I'm, I'm jumping forward, but I remember, I, I remember that there, there was, a, the HBO executives asked me to come to LA they said, if you come to LA, we'll help you get representation. That's what they said. So, so even so, after I won the fe after I won the festival, after I won the award, I flew to LA, uh, and I stayed in a. I remember it was a twenty-seven dollar a night uh, Airbnb room with a weird Russian like owner who was like always in the living room, like watching TV. Strange place, but whatever. It, it, it did the it did the trick, and uh, eventually I ended up going from there to staying at my manager's like mansion in West Hollywood. He had a guest room, beautiful place, pool, modern, like huge doors, you know, like, it's like a mansion almost, it was like incredible. And uh, <laughs> so I ended up going there anyway. Anyway, so yeah, so I pressed them on it and um, uh, you know, and they weren't uh, receptive. All these HBO people who told me to come and that they refer me reps. Now I'm in LA and I'm like, what's up, I'm in LA. And they're like, not really like responding. So I had, again, it was like a thing I had to like bust their balls. You know, I'd be like, yo, you ask me to come out here. I'm out here, like, what's up? Like, you know, only later do you realize, you know, after being in the business a certain amount of time, you kind of realize that um, everybody's got their own shit going on. You know, like there's always projects and things that are, people are working on and you're, you're very in, insignificant. Um, in that priority list, and that's the truth, and you have to realize that. But that's why you gotta follow up so many times, right? Because everybody's got a million things they gotta do. They they got shows they're working on. They got you know meetings they're doing. Maybe their bosses on their ass. So the last thing they're thinking about is that kid who wants that festival a few months ago, who's looking for representation. So, uh, but anyway, all that to say, you know, I was incessant, you know, just just you know, always hitting them up, and finally. You know, they were like, okay, 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 and they started sending my stuff out um, to to the agencies, and then that's when all the agencies started hitting hitting me up. Signed with uh, UTA at that time, um, and you know that they started bringing me projects. And at the same time, from Stanhope at that same film festival, there was a representative of the Sony Diverse Directors Program there. His name was Brett King, and he invited me to this program, this directors program which essentially um, preps you and prepares you to direct TV episodes. Right. 
Um, so another reason why I went to LA, so I went there and I also went to that program and, um, they bring in showrunners, other TV directors, TV producers, um, you know, uh, executives that are current, right? They're called current execs, which are executives that work on, obviously, you know, Jeff, but they're executives that work on, uh, shows that are currently on the air and can really help book you on one of their episodes. And all these people come in and they share your work with these people and whatever work they like, uh, they find a show that's in that same wheelhouse and they have you shadow on that show. Shadow being um, you shadow the director. So you go on that show as a potential director, learning how the set works, uh, learning how the director works in the hopes that you will get an episode to direct yourself. So Who did you shadow? with that, I shadowed uh, Ed Bianchi. Mm-hmm. Um, who's an OG in the TV uh, directing world. He's basically directed on every drama you, you can think of, almost every drama you can think of. And, um, and he took me under his wing, man. We, we hit it off. That's my guy. Uh, you know, uh, I shadowed him on this show called The Get Down with Baz Norman, who I also shadowed. So that was crazy. I got to meet Baz Norman and, and, uh, and shadow him. And he was an amazing guy too, super energetic, very positive energy. And uh, eventually, my film started making the Stan Hope started making the rounds in that uh, crew, and uh, uh, Bass saw it, and um, and Bianchi saw it, and they were like, "Oh, this kid's got it. Let's give him some scenes. Let's give him some second unit stuff uh, to do." And next thing you know, I'm shooting scenes, um, and the get down was so crazy, it was so funny that that was. Uh, where I went because the get down at that time was known as the biggest production in New York City, the most expensive production in New York City. So I went from the cheapest film from New York to the most expensive series in New York. And it was still the same type of mentality because they were so disorganized that they didn't have prep days and stuff like that. It was just like, here's your location, here's uh, your your pages, um, and make it happen. And for me, I was like, I was like, you know, I was so green where I thought that's how it was. You know, I was like, all right, let's go. I was excited. I was like, let's do it. Meanwhile, you know, a seasoned director would look at that and be like, what the fuck do you mean? Let's just do it. Like, what are you talking about? We haven't even tech scouted this. And what, what, what the fuck is going on? You know what I mean? So me, I was like, they saw me as that guy that was like, I'll do it all. You know, I was the cleanup guy and I was very happy to do it. And I was now I'm getting paid. You know, now I'm getting paid like you know, good money, you know what I mean? Like, like you're getting that, starting to get that DGA money, those day rates and stuff like that, which was like, you know, hitting the lottery. So, so I was all the way with that and that's where I started. That's how I started. And, um, and, uh, you know, I did a great job on all that stuff. I did what they wanted. And then, um, they started to just pass my name around and, uh, and then I did the Fox director's program, um, which led into, shadowing on uh well i didn't shadow that led to my first tv offer on snowfall f for fx and then and then uh then i went to nbc uh did the nbc directors program which led to um blind spot and then uh and then later led to um uh blacklist so once you once you so did you have to do a director's program after you shot snowfall because you did two episodes of snowfall didn't you you still had yeah, to do well, a director's program, or was that before you directed that episode? I'm pretty sure I did all the programs without having directed an episode makes first. Right. That makes more sense. Yeah, I think yeah. I think they were like they were like um, I bo- I might have booked one, uh, but I haven't shot it. I didn't shoot it yet, and, and I did another director's program. And what was? Can you just explain what it was like stepping into Snowfall for the first time? Um, it was. Um, it was a lady and it was like, uh, it was amazing because um, that was the first time where I saw, I mean, I saw it in the shadowing, but I wasn't really paying attention. But th- this is the first time where I, you have a full hour meeting to talk about wardrobe. You have a full hour meeting to talk about makeup and special effects. You have a full hour to talk about the stunts or, or more like so much time, so much prep time that to me, it was like, what the fuck is all of this? Like, I don't need all this. You know, I was like, let's just go. You know, I was used to just, you know, figuring it out and just the indie style of just going to shoot, going and shooting it. You know what I mean? And figuring it out. So I remember like, it was like, it was like, to, it, it, it was just so laxed 
compared to what I was used to. You know, it's like everybody relax, sit down, let's talk about it. You know, we have all we have eight days before we're starting to shoot. Like we have, we can ease into this real smoothly. And I remember being like, wow, this is like you know a lot easier. <laughs> so it was great because I so I went from because so, it's like I got thrown in the gauntlet and then taken out, and then everything was kind of like you know a breeze. You know, you know after that, you know what I mean. Yeah. So. So it ended up, you know, all these things kind of happened for a reason, right? Now that Slick had become a legitimized television director, he had earned the ability to reap the rewards of being offered lots of work to direct. Instead, he did what you rarely see people do, and he went back to his roots and decided to again write, direct, produce, and act in his own material. And that's how the Netflix TV show It's Bruno was born. I went out and I shot episodes myself with that same full circle crew um, and some extra people and shot it myself and edited it myself and put the music in it myself and so and, and wrote it and it's the same process and, and, and I you know spent a little bit of money my, you know doing that myself and and I had at the end I, I had a full episode pr pretty much the pilot I, I pretty much kind of did the pilot already and with that uh, you know, in, in combination uh, with my representation, um, now that I have now I have representation and I've directed some episodes and uh, now I have a little more of a you know of a resume, um, we went out with that package and um, surprisingly got passed on. To me, I couldn't believe it. I said, "What? How, how the fuck do these people not see this?" So I went back out and I shot another two episodes. So now I have three episodes that I shot. These are small, like short, short episodes. And I remember after we put all three of them together, it came out to like 22 minutes, 23 minutes. And I'm like, oh, look, this is like a full episode of like a comedy show now like, you know, that, that we put together. And so, so now I have three full episodes where, with storylines that are continuing and, you know, and, um, you know, promising future, uh, you know, uh, arcs and stuff like that. And now with those three episodes and uh, a full season breakdown on how they would continue, we went back out with that and then started getting offers. You know, then people started, re okay, seeing the bigger picture and go, okay, so there's something here. And, um, and it was, um, it was a, a company called Stage 13 that was at Warner Brothers. That was with Warner Brothers that we ended up uh, going with. Um, and uh, and that was a whole journey too. Like, that's crazy too. Like, they were gonna make it, uh, like literally, they put a budget together and we were gonna do the whole season with them. And we were getting so excited. And um, AT&T comes and buys out Warner Brothers. Uh, and they end up uh, acquiring WB and uh, they're basically like, what's this little shit you guys got going on over here? No, thank you. You know, we want the big stuff. We want the big movies and big shows. And we just kind of got tossed uh, aside, right? Like right when we were like, like about locking everything down, you know? So that was very depressing and, you know, uh, demotivating, you know, and um, it was whack. And uh, luckily, there was just like a, one of the head uh, of the the head of that department. His name was Chris Mack. He took a hail mary swing. Um, a couple, some of his friends went and moved to over to Netflix, and he loved the show so much that he just threw it at them. He was like, "Yo, like we were gonna make this, but um, you know, the AT and T merger sliced our budget, um, cut us out. We, are you guys interested in this?" And Netflix looked at you know everything I shot and everything I talked about. They were like, "This is we love this. Let's do it." And that's how that. that and then, so everything got picked, ramped back up, and we ended up getting more money, even though it was still very little uh, for a for a TV show. Um, and it all ended up working, you know, uh, you know, in a better way. And it certainly did. Not long after the show aired, Slick got a call from his publicist, and it was good news. My publicist called me and was like, hey, um, she's like, how's it feel to be Emmy nominated? That's what she told me. And I was like, what? And, I was like, and then I started bugging out. I was like, that's crazy. I was like, I couldn't believe it. Uh, it was nuts. It was nuts. It was a great feeling, though. And, um, you know, and just to know the journey, you know, and the, it was a very, you know, what's funny is that I skipped over something, but it was, it was like, it was, it was almost 
back to full circle days. Because somehow, even with more money and, um, you know, a bigger crew, somehow it almost didn't get made again. Like, the, like every, like I was trying to bring my friends on to produce and they just didn't have that capacity. To, to, they just didn't know what to do. And um, I was hoping that they could learn along the way and that was my mistake. And so we almost dropped the ball ourselves on our side and this whole thing almost got cut off. We, were, we, were, we weren't gonna hit certain deadlines and stuff like that. So I had to bring in this other producer, these other producers in to help me at the last second. Um, like to secure this, the, the funding, the first installment of funding. And we did that, and it, but I remember it was, it was one of those things where it was like, you know, I had to pull a couple of all-nighters again, where I was like, everything felt, to, again, was on my shoulders, just like the full circle days. And, um, it, but, but it all ended all come, it all ended up all coming together. And even during production, there was like one time in particular where it looked like we might have been, we might get shut down again. You know, yeah, we had a fucked up AD. Right. And AD almost like sabotaged the whole project. Why? You know what happened? Uh, this fucking guy, um, you know, we, we missed the signs. I guess in prep he was fine, but like this guy wasn't eating at all. He was like a heavy smoker. And um, I guess the stress of, of a low budget series got to him. And um, I, uh, he he just wasn't able to do his he wasn't doing his job you know what I mean like we were fucking calling cut we were me and the DP were ended up doing his job and uh, he ended up like walking off with like a set with like a couple of key crew members and then like writing this like scathing email about like the safety of like him and his crew when that's his fucking job like it's, it's like part of his job was to make sure like the crew is safe and like. He just didn't like, you know, the Cavalier way, uh, I guess, you know, we would shoot in New York and um, mixed with a lot of other crazy stuff. And he walked off and he was like, you know, going to like, he, uh, I think it was like, it got to a point where it was like, he was going to like tell the studio that, you know, we're doing unsafe things and people are, people are almost dying. So just, just making ridiculous shit up to uh, give himself uh, a legitimate excuse to, to leave the set, to, to walk off. Which, was, which, which he didn't have, so he was kind of conjuring up this bunch of bullshit to, to make him look like, you know, he had a reason to leave. And that almost got to the studio, and that, was, that would have shut us down again. And anyway, it didn't happen, and that guy's, you know, who knows where, where that guy is now, but um, uh, unfortunately, he still got a couple credits, you know, so I'm like, <laughs> I, this is why, let this be a lesson, like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who's on what, still get your references, you know, yeah. you might see some crew member or somebody did this amazing show you loved, and you're like, oh, he he or she did that show. We're definitely hiring them. <laughs> Meanwhile, you you haven't spoke to those guys. Like maybe give them a call and see how they like working it's with a, that person. It's a good, very good point. So listen, that's an amazing um, story, and that's a great point too. And um, part one, in part two, we'll come back and we'll start talking a little bit about your uh, process and some of the more defining moments in your career. Slick Naim, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'm not going to ask you to give it a five-star review or for you to subscribe. And there is no Patreon site. I created this show to help people who don't have mentors or role models. People who want to work in the film industry but don't know which path they should take. So if you know someone who might like or benefit from the show, all I'm asking is for you to share it with them. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be listening to their story. Remember 19 media.